Thank you very much. It's a joy to be here. I've been uh, serving the Lord in this way for 40 some years. And uh, as I was telling some of the pastors uh, about an hour ago, there is a movement that has been begun uh, and it is growing. More and more Christians in North America are learning why they believe what they believe. And it is a movement that will not be stopped. Something is happening here that God is orchestrating. And this conference is just an example of that. And it's a privilege to be here. I can't think of another place I'd rather be on my birthday than here, uh, encouraging you and receiving encouragement from you as we all seek to serve Christ more effectively and thoughtfully uh, in this very important area. Not long ago, a prominent Ivy League professor made the following statement. Let me summarize my views loudly and clearly. There are no gods, there are no purposes, there are no goal-directed forces of any kind. There is no life after death. When I die, I'm absolutely certain that I'm going to be dead. That's the end of me. There is no ultimate foundation for ethics, no ultimate meaning in life, and no free will for human beings either. Now, this is an odd statement. I mean, if a person is going to say that nothing matters, one would think that it, one would not take the time to have to make a statement like that. I mean, if nothing matters, why, why say it? Apparently, he thought it was an important thing to say that nothing is important. But, 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 uh, but apart from that, this statement represents a growing segment of the population in Western culture and it represents an important part of some of the academic elites that, that are in charge of the universities in Canada and the United States. Um, and this is just the, the tip of an iceberg as to what has been happening, I think, for some time. A few years ago, I was speaking at, over the weekend in Seattle, and uh, I was flying back to Southern California, uh, and it was Sunday morning, I was waiting for my flight, I picked up a copy of the Seattle Times, and I turned to the editorial page, and there on the front page was the lead editorial, a very large editorial, syndicated, so it went around to several newspapers that Sunday morning, entitled The Divided Nation. And the article went on to say that the United States is now in the most divided period of her history since the Civil War. What was interesting to me, and I do, by the way, agree with that statement, what was interesting was the thing the author said is fundamentally dividing us. He did not say that the fundamental division is political, which is interesting. He said the fundamental division is not racial. The fundamental division is not socioeconomic. And the fundamental division isn't gender. The fundamental thing that is dividing people into two camps is a division about worldview. Worldview. And he said there are two different schools of thought. He was really wrong about that. There are three, I think, which we'll talk about shortly. But he said there were two different schools of thought. There were ethical monotheists that believe in a supreme being who created us and is the foundation for objective morality and evangelical Christians and conservative Catholics form the core of that group. And then there are those that do not either believe in God or don't know much about her, if she's out there, or they're out there, or it's out there, or whatever's there. And so on their view, either God doesn't exist or there's not much that can be known about God, and so it doesn't matter. And they opt for a secular view of the world. The author went on to say that the dominant leaders in Western culture are on the secular side, the universities, the media, and the entertainment industry. And it is primarily conservative evangelical churches that lead the ethical monotheistic side. So we live in a day when the power differential falls in the hands of those who don't believe in God or Jesus Christ. And something needs to happen about that. And, and just going about church in the standard way is not going to be adequate to that task. Now, today, it is not simply the case that you are considered to be ignorant if you are a follower of Jesus. You are also considered a bigot. 
Indeed, for the first time to my knowledge in recorded Western history, the religion of Jesus is no longer simply regarded as superstitious, it is now regarded as being immoral. Thus, not long ago, a novelist made the following statement in a, in a magazine, speaking of followers of Jesus, here is how their ignorant bigotry works. First, they put the fear of God into you. If you don't believe the literal word of the Bible, you'll burn in hell. Of course, the literal word of the Bible is tremendously contradictory, and so you have to abdicate all critical thinking and accept a simple system of belief that it's dangerous to question. So we'll cancel the Q&A time a little bit later. <laughs> a corollary to this, thank you, ma'am. A corollary to this point is that it is my birthday after all. So thank you very much. A corollary to this point is that they make sure that you understand that Satan resides in the toils and snares of complex thought, so it's best not to try to think at all. The popular image is that the religion of Jesus is for thoughtless people, people who don't value thinking. Not long ago, Robert Reich, who was former Secretary of Labor in the United States, made the following statement. Listen carefully to his words. The great conflict of the 21st century will not be between the West and terrorism. That's news in and of itself. Terrorism is a tactic, not a belief. The true battle of the 21st century will be between modern civilization and anti-modernists. Between those who believe in the primacy of the individual and those who believe that human beings owe their allegiance to a higher power. Between those who give priority to this life and those who believe that human life is a mere preparation for existence beyond the grave. Between those who believe in science, reason, and logic and those who believe that truth is revealed through scripture and religious dogma. Terrorism will destroy and disrupt lives but terrorism is not the greatest danger we face. Conservative religious believers is the greatest danger we face. Now, it is in the midst of that context that I and my colleagues are calling the church to rededicate herself to a vibrant life of the mind and to re-engage the culture non-defensively and in a non-angry kind of way, in a civil kind way, but in a rigorous and thoughtful sort of way. And what I'd like to do is to take a look at a couple of texts in the New Testament. There are, I know my audience is diverse, and I wanna give you just a simple definition of apologetics, and then look at a couple of texts in the New Testament. Then I'm gonna tell you what I think the three worldviews are that are contending for allegiance, and then we will identify the central tension that is at the heart of the differences of opinion among advocates of those three worldviews. What is apologetics? It's not apologizing for something, um, as I was accused of by someone who wrote to Ardeen uh, complaining that we had courses on apologetics at Biola University and we have nothing to apologize for. So what is that about? I'm not, I'm not make, I don't make these things up, ladies and gentlemen. I just report them. So that actually happened. Apologetics comes from the Greek word apologeomai, and it means to defend, as in a court of law, to defend something. Apologetics is a ministry of giving reasons for believing in Christianity and responding to objections raised against it. Let me say that again. It is a ministry of giving reasons to believe in Christianity and responding to objections raised against it. Now, note very carefully, folks, that apologetics is fundamentally a ministry of helping people. It is a way to care for souls. It is not about winning arguments that may be involved. It's certainly not about being argumentative. And it's not about being angry. It's about helping people. It follows from this that if somebody is not wanting to be helped, apologetics isn't gonna do them much good. So you have to have someone who's willing to be helped, who wants help, who's, got, who's willing to listen. For an unbeliever, apologetics is an attempt to help them remove difficulties they have in considering seriously the claims of Jesus of Nazareth. 
For someone who is already his follower, apologetics is an attempt to remove obstacles to spiritual growth and flourishing in the kingdom. And so I like to talk about apologetics as a form of ministry, and it is a people-caring ministry. And this, this takes it out of the realm of debate, it, and debate is involved, and I'm, I believe in that, but debate should be seen uh, as a way of helping people come to terms with the claims of Christianity. Now, um, I want you to turn to, uh, if you have a New Testament, to 2 Corinthians chapter 10. Matthew, Mark, Luke, 2 Corinthians. That is not true, ladies and gentlemen. Glad to see that you're with me here. Okay. Now, I, if, if you're a follower of Jesus here this evening, and if you're, if you're an, not a follower of Jesus, you may all yourself know that spiritual warfare is real. There are demons. Demons are not a figment of people's imaginations. They're actually alive and real, and they influence people. The key text on spiritual warfare in the New Testament is Ephesians 6. We won't look at that, but that's the key text. And in that text, we see things like praying against the devil and praying for people that are being oppressed by him. I myself have been involved in exorcisms where I have seen people delivered from demonic oppression through prayer. I've seen it with my own eyes. I know that's real. And the target of that kind of spiritual engagement is our demons themselves. In the, the second most important text on spiritual warfare in the New Testament is 2 Corinthians chapter 10. And beginning in verse 3, it says the following, Though we walk in the flesh, that means as human beings, we do not war according to the flesh. So the Apologetics Canada Conference is not going to be selling guns and, and uh, grenades and we're going we're gonna to take over the local McDonald's. Uh, it's not going to work like that. Um, and because in verse 4, the weapons of our warfare aren't like that. That's not how we fight warfare. Instead, our weapons are divinely powerful for the destruction of what? Fortresses fortresses. So in this kind of warfare, we don't target the demonic, we target fortresses. That raises the question, what is a fortress? And the simple answer is, a fortress is an idea or a theory of some kind. It's an idea or a theory of some kind that undermines the knowledge of God. Look in verse 5. We are destroying speculations and every lofty thought raised up against the knowledge of God. Note not the power of God, but the knowledge of God. And so, for example, the claim that you can only know things if you can see them is a fortress. And that is an idea that needs to be destroyed according to this particular text. There are a number of ideas that are circulating in Western culture that need to be targeted. Now, how do you destroy an idea? You don't yell at it, you don't censor it. The way that you destroy an idea is by reasoning against it, by arguing against it. That's how you destroy an idea. You provide an argument against the idea. So what I wanna to suggest to you is that the task of apologetics is a local church function because it is a part of spiritual warfare. People, think of it this way. How do people control other people? What's a good way to control people? Well, the answer is, one way, is if I can control how you think and feel, I can control you. If, if, if someone can control the way other people think and how they feel, they can be controlled. Now the point would be then that, that the, the demons and the devil are involved in attempting to control culture. They want to control culture and one of the targets of spiritual warfare then will be the center of ideas that are being generated in any culture. Now if I'm right about that, and it seems like I've accurately understood the text here, it would seem then that one of the things that we do in church and one of the things that we Christians need to do is to be conversant with the ideas that are in our culture 
and learn how to reason against them in appropriate kinds of ways. Why? Because folks, this is at the core of spiritual warfare. It is at the very heart of it. We are largely at the mercy of our ideas. People largely live at the mercy of their ideas. And that means that ideas shape behavior and various sorts of things and it's up to us as Christians to be involved in that contest of ideas and to be winsome and intelligent participants in that dialogue. Now that doesn't mean that we all have to be scholars. Some are called to that, others aren't. But I will tell you this, every person in this room can get a little bit better at your game in this area. We can all improve a little bit. We could all start doing a little more reading. We can listen to some CDs. We can do a little more studying and learn why we believe what we believe. Why? Because that is a part of being excellent in spiritual warfare. Because in spiritual warfare, we target strongholds and not just the demonic itself. That's the first then basis for apologetics in the New Testament, that it is a central part of spiritual warfare. Now, there's another biblical basis for apologetics, and I'd like you, if you would, please, to turn back to Matthew chapter 22. Matthew chapter 22. I'm going to read in verse 37 and 38, but let me set the context for you. Uh, In this particular text, an intellectual, it would be someone like a UC Berkeley professor, has come up to Jesus and basically said to him, if you know your stuff, would would you summarize in a few sentences the 39 books of the Old Testament? That's a tough, anybody who's had a survey of the Old Testament knows that that's a tough job. And Jesus was up to the task. He said, you want a summary of the whole Old Testament? Here it is in two sentences. Love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. Pretty good answer. What I want to suggest is that the very first statement Jesus makes is that we are to love God with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength. Now, it's not just those four He was picking different facets of the human personality to emphasize that we are to love him with everything we have. Now, would you agree with me that if someone had damaged emotions, perhaps due to various kinds of abuse, they would find it difficult to love God with their affections. That would be a hard thing for them to learn how to do. Would you agree with me that if someone had an addicted will so that they had a very highly addicted personality, so that their will was shriveled, they would have a tough time loving God in obedience. That would be harder for them than someone who was not addictive. I think both of those are pretty commonsensical. By the same token, however, if someone didn't know how to think very well, they wouldn't be able to love God with their minds as much as they could. Because Jesus teaches very clearly in this text that a part of the love for God is to love God with an excellent mind. And that means that Christianity is a thoughtful religion. It is a thinking person's religion. It is a religion that places a high value on reason and on the intellectual life and on a life of study and reflection and thought. Christianity is a lot more than that. It's also about the the spirit in us and about the affections and so on. But it is at least includes loving God with all our minds. Now, may I suggest to you that the task of loving God with your mind includes knowing why you believe what you believe. Now, how do I know that? Because in the preceding verse, from verses 25 to 33, Jesus has demonstrated I believe, what an aspect of what it means to love God with your mind. And here is essentially what has happened. You have two top university professors, we'll say the Stanford and Berkeley professors, have called a meeting, a colloquium meeting, and they're having it at Stanford and all their grad students are with them. And they're going to invite an itinerant professor who lectures at universities 
but doesn't have an accredited PhD to come and give a lecture so they can spoof him and show how stupid he is. And if the, in so doing, they will inoculate their students from following after him. And so what we have are the two intellectual groups of Jesus' day. And by the way, Jerusalem was one of the leading intellectual centers of the ancient Near Eastern world. And we have the Pharisees and the Sadducees who are trying to trap Jesus. And the Sadducees do not believe in life after death, and the Pharisees do. And so the Sadducees come up to Jesus and they raise what is called a reductio ad absurdum argument against Jesus. In logic, a reductio ad absurdum argument is where you grant your, prim, your opponent's position for the sake of argument, even though you think it's false, and then you show that if we grant your premise, it leads to a contradiction, therefore you should give up your premise. So you grant the person's viewpoint, you show that it leads to a contradiction, and you conclude, therefore, your viewpoint is false. And they come up to Jesus and say, you believe in life after death, do you? Well, then what do you do with this? Here's a woman married to a man, and he dies, and she marries his brother, and he dies, and she keeps marrying until she's married all seven of them. As I said this afternoon, what she was feeding those men, no one really knows. <laughs> but it was certainly not entirely a healthy kind of a diet that they were on. I will suggest that to you. But in any case, she goes to heaven, and now they're all there. And they say to Jesus, you believe, in, you believe in life after death? To whom is she married? And you got two options. One, you can say she's married to the f first man or one of the men, in which case Moses sanctions adultery with the other six. You believe in adul adultery, Jesus? Well, then you might want to go that option. The other option is bigamy. She's married to all seven, polygamy rather. So which do you like, polygamy or adultery? If you don't like either one of those, then you've got to give up belief in life after death. So they've tried to reduce his view of life after death to a contradiction, to a conclusion where you go A or B, neither one's a good option, so you've got to give up what led me there. Now, I want you to know what Jesus did. He was prepared in this kind of academic setting to engage them intelligently. Jesus Christ was a smart man. He knew what he was talking about. And he was comfortable not only with, the, with blue collar people and fishermen and farmers, he was also comfortable interacting with intellectually gifted and trained people of his day. And I pray to, that the day will come when the church will feel more and more comfortable in engaging the university and, to, and talk radio and things of that sort. So what does Jesus do? Well, Jesus basically says, uh, fellas, you've put me on the horns of a dilemma. You've said I've either got to go with adultery or polygamy. Unfortunately, both of these options make an assumption. Namely, there's marriage in heaven. There's no marriage in heaven, so you don't have an argument. And with one statement, he, dis, he pulls the central plank of their argument, and it was, out from underneath them, and they don't have an argument any longer. Then he plays with them. He, you know, if you know the context, he does. And he says, have you not read? And then he cites one of their key verses. <laughs> And he's gonna use one of the Sadducean party's key verses to show that their key verse teaches his view of the afterlife, not theirs. <laughs> and this would be a verse they would teach on regularly. So when he says, haven't you read, he's, playing, he's toying with them. Surely they, they knew this by heart. And he says, have you not read? The scripture says, I am the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. God is not the God of the dead, but of the living. Now here's what he meant. If their view is correct and Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob lived and died and they didn't, there's no afterlife, the text should have said I was the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Just like I would say to you, I was a student at the University of Southern California because that's not going on now. It was in the past. That's not what it says. It doesn't say I was the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. It says I am the God. I continue to be the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob and the only way he can continue to be their God is if they continue to exist. Now what we have, and this is what we need to do with our grandchildren, I have four of them, and our children, 
We need to showcase Jesus of Nazareth as an intellectually sophisticated, intelligent person, as well as a person who is comfortable with ordinary folk. He could go bo at both ends of the, st as of the scale. And we need, to get the, we need to set the record straight on this. And he wants his followers to be like him in that way. So why do I believe in apologetics? Is biblically, well, there are a number of texts that command this. Be ready to give an answer to anyone who asks you. You've heard that, 1 Peter 3.15. If you look in the book of Acts, Paul and the apostles defend the faith. They deal legizomai with their opponents by giving arguments and reasons. But the two reasons I've given you this evening for engaging in apologetics is number one, it is absolutely central to spiritual warfare. Our Christian schools should be war colleges, training people to engage the world of ideas. And the second reason is that I want to be like Jesus. And when Jesus said, love your God with your mind, he wasn't kidding, he meant it. And as a part of loving God with your mind, it's learning how to respond to questions that people raise. And we all are in process on this. I'm still learning and growing, and I hope you are too. That's the bottom line. So apologetics is intensely biblical, and it is at the center of the Christian religion. It is not the only thing at the center of the Christian religion, but it is crucial to a life well-lived in the kingdom of God, the art of apologetics. Now, in the time we have left, I want to talk about these worldviews, and I want to say something about the tension that I think is present in them. As I see it, there are three worldviews that are competing for the hearts and minds of people in North America. And this would also be true in Europe. The first worldview I'm happy to say is supernatural Christianity. Christianity of, that believes in a supernatural world is a vibrant worldview. It is a vibrant worldview. And this, this worldview has been gaining ground in the university for the last 20 years. And I want to tell you things have never been better in my lifetime than they are today in the academic community regarding Christianity. We still have work to do, but take heart. Let your heart be encouraged. Something is happening that is incredible and that we've got more work to do, but I'm encouraged by what I'm seeing. Let that strengthen you and let, and let your heart and mind be encouraged by that fact. So Christianity uh, is a major, vibrant worldview. By the way, Christianity celebrates science. It loves science. It's not science that's the problem. It's a certain philosophical views about science that are the problem, and I'll come to that now, because the second worldview, which is very clearly the dominant worldview in Western culture, this is the dominant view, is scientific naturalism. Scientific naturalism. This worldview includes an epistemology and an ontology. The epistemology for our purposes right now is one's view of knowledge, the nature and limits of knowledge. That's what epistemology is in this context. The epistemology of naturalism is the idea that you can only gain knowledge of the world by testing things with your five senses. So if you can see it, touch it, taste it, smell it, or hear it, or in some way test a claim with one of your five senses, then you could know whether or not it's true. So for example, I could know whether or not there are music stands in this room because I could test that claim with my five senses and lo and behold, there is one. I could test whether there was a unicorn in the room. You no, you could, because a unicorn, by its very nature, is sense perceptible. So if there were unicorns, you ought to be able to see them. Since we can search the room and not see any, it's highly unlikely that there are unicorns in the room. All right? Yeah. It's, it's always nice when you get laughs when you weren't trying to be funny. I appreciate that. <laughs> I I, thank God bless you for it. Um, now, what about demons? What about the reality of demons? That you can't test those with your five senses. What about the claim that, uh, that kindness is a virtue and we ought to tell the truth to people? Unfortunately, you can't test any of those claims by your five senses. So on this view, knowledge is limited to what you can ultimately test with your five senses. 
That's the nature of knowledge. The limits of knowledge will turn out to be knowledge is limited to the hard sciences. If you want to know about reality, the only way to know about reality or the vastly superior way of knowing about reality is physics, chemistry, geology, neuroscience, and so on. So I was at a dinner party years ago and a man, I was told that a PhD from Johns Hopkins was going to be at the dinner party and he hated Christianity and I was gonna give an evangelistic talk at this gathering. And we were at the hors d'oeuvre table and here this, I could see my friend bring obviously this gentleman in. So they come and introduce themselves to him at the hors d'oeuvre table and no sooner did we exchange pleasantries when this gentleman lit into me. He said, see I understand that you're a philosopher and a theologian. And I said, well, I give it my best shot. And he said, yeah, he said, I used to be interested in that kind of stuff when I was a teenager. <laughs> and he said, but I outgrew it. When I matured, I began to realize that if you can't quantify your data and prove it in the lab, you can't know it. And if you can't test it empirically in the, in the laboratory, it's nothing but a bunch of hot air. That's the view I'm talking about, that science either science alone or science is vastly superior to any other form of knowledge. Now, there are a lot of problems with that claim. Not the least of which is the claim is self-refuting. Uh, something is self-refuting if it makes itself false. Like the statement, there are no sentences longer than three words, uh, that's self-refuting. That sentence falsifies itself. The claim that you can only know things through the methods of science is not itself something that you can know through the methods of science. So the statement itself would by his own standards be hot air. <laughs> and I pointed that out to him. <laughs> I said, you know, it's interesting, you've made about 30 comments so far, sir, and I said, I can't think of anything so far that's come out of your mouth that I would have the foggiest idea how to quantify and test in the lab. If I'm right about that, <laughs> you see my problem here. Uh, I don't know what to make of your own assertions. It was, it was an interesting evening. <laughs> but, um, <laughs> but that's the problem. Now, in addition to that, there are a whole bunch of things we know that we don't know with our senses. For example, the truths of mathematics and logic are what, are, what philosophers call a priori disciplines. That's A-P-R-I-O-R-I which means prior to sense experience. We don't know the proofs in logic and in mathematics by anything that you can appeal to that you can see, touch, taste, smell, or hear. Logical truths and mathematical truths are known in, in epistemically prior to, to, to the use of the five senses. As a matter of fact, we don't know the, the truths of arithmetic and logic through science. Indeed, science presupposes mathematics. Science can't prove mathematics. You with me? Okay. Here's another example of things that we know that you can't see, touch, taste, smell, or hear, or quantify. Consciousness. Right now, you know what you're thinking through what's called introspection. You can be aware of your own sensations if you're feeling a pain in your knee, or if you're thirsty, or my, my voice is irritating you, um, or you're thinking about something else, or whatever, or whether you believe two and two is four. Um, those are states of consciousness. They're, they're just like there are three states of water, okay? There are five states of consciousness, sensations, thoughts, beliefs, desires, and acts of free will. And those are all different st states that your conscious life can be in. Now, you can tell when you're in a state of thinking about something or whether you believe something or you desire ice cream or having a sensation of pain or whether you've, your arm went up because it just jerked or you raised it. Freely, you can tell the difference. But you can't see, con thoughts are disgustingly invisible. And, and thoughts aren't made out of matter. Philosophers may have heavy thoughts, but they don't need neck braces, okay? <laughs> because they're not those sorts of things. Your knowledge of consciousness is something that you can know without using your five senses. I mean, I don't want to get weird here, but, but the fact is that you know which senses in the room are yours without using your senses. I mean, you can tell which sensory experiences are yours as opposed to your neighbors, right? I mean, have you ever, anybody ever been confused about which visual sensations were yours? <laughs> no, I mean, you go to a party and somebody says, oh, would you give me my visual sensations back? 
I mean, you're looking at the punch bowl for me and I can't see it because you got my sensations, you know. <laughs> it's not gonna happen. Well, I mean, I'm not, you, we all know which sensations are ours, but we don't know it by looking around the room and saying, man, there's 700 pairs of sensations in here. There are mine right there. Uh, no, we don't do it that way. You know, I leave his homework for the task of how we do know these things. It's a very interesting question. It has something to do with the fact that this body is deeply connected to your soul and nobody else's. That's a, a part of the answer. All right, now, the point is then that the epistemology of naturalism is in trouble. And naturalism not only has an epistemology, but it has an ontology. Ontology means a view of what's real. And the ontology of naturalism is basically the idea that the physical world is all there is, there's nothing outside the physical world, and within the physical world, within the world, everything is matter, everything is physical. So that's, that's the view of what is real. Now there are all kinds of problems with this and I, I can't go into great detail on it. Um, I'm, I'm among those who believe that, that in things called abstract objects. An abstract object is something that's real, that exists outside space and time, like numbers. I think numbers are real. Uh, if numbers are real, then the physical universe isn't all there is because there are things that exist that are not physical. Another example would be the self and consciousness, your ego, your own I, and consciousness aren't physical. And we can't go into this now, but you're not your brain. Um, one of the reasons we know that you're not your brain is because your brain can come in percentages, but you can't. You could have 80% of a brain in Dandy Walker's system, there are people, a syndrome, some, there are people who have 10% of a brain. Well, they're not 10% of a person. Persons are all or nothing. They can't be divided into percentages. The brain is, an all or, is not an all or nothing thing. It, does, it is divisible into percentages. Therefore, you can't be identical to your brain. It's just a simple argument, but it can be supported with, with uh, more rigorous underpinnings. So the knowledge of the soul and the knowledge of consciousness are not, uh, excuse me, consciousness and the self are not physical. So there are things that exist that aren't physical. That's the point. Naturalism is a dominant worldview in American culture. And scientists are given far too much authority to speak about things for which they're not trained. It's very, very important to know that. The third worldview is postmodern relativism. Postmodern relativism. Now, there are different Degrees of postmodernism, and I grant that. There are certain forms of what I consider to be low-grade postmodernism, where people are into postmodern architecture or things of that sort, uh, with which I have no beef. But the more extreme forms of philosophical postmodernism involve a very deep-seated kind of cultural relativism. And it's basically the idea that all truth and reality are relative to your culture. What's real and true for one culture is not necessarily real and true for another culture, and no one's wrong. Everybody's right relative to their group. And so this basic idea teaches that there is no such thing as reality. There's no reality. Um, there's no such thing, for example, as gender. Gender is a social construction. There is no such thing as masculinity. Masculinity is whatever a culture says it is. Same thing's true of trees and mountains. There aren't no such things as trees or mountains. Trees or mountains are whatever a culture says they are. And cultures differ. And so this is called the social construction of reality, where reality is a creation of a culture's ideas. Truth, there is no such thing as objective truth. Truth is what your culture will allow you to get away with saying without being challenged. So truth is relative to culture and linguistic practices. All ethical claims are completely relative. Now again, the problem is that postmodernism turns out again to be self-refuting because postmodernism claims to give a description of reality according to which there is no such thing as objective reality. And the postmodernists offer their views as being true about the fact there's no truth. Now, some postmodernists, like Richard Rorty, 
are smart enough to know that, that they can't think their own views are true. And so Rorty, who is a postmodernist who denies an objective view of truth, says, and I don't even take my own postmodernism to be true. Okay, now, in which case the, the, the correct question would be, why are my kids paying to go to university to study with somebody who doesn't even think his own views are true? <laughs> why, why should anyone listen to him? If he doesn't even think his own views are true, I'm not saying that he, that he has to know they're true. He doesn't even think truth applies to his own views. Why, why should we listen to him? So, so postmodernism suffers with its inability to handle truth. And we'll talk about truth uh, in, in just a little bit here. Another thing that you might want to point out to someone who holds these views is that no one really believes them and they know better. Let me give you an illustration of this. Uh, years ago, I ran across a fellow in Southern California. Uh, it was at a store I was buying something. We got in a conversation and it turned out that he was a relativist. He didn't believe in any moral absolutes. And I knew that he really did believe in them. So what I did is I found out what he cared about and I found out he really loved the environment. And so I said to him, look, I don't know what you're gonna think of me, but I've got four buddies. And once a month, we put 50 bucks each into a kitty at $250. We buy a 100 gallon drum of sulfuric acid. We, we go out to Lake Paris out here, about 60 miles from here, take one of the guy's boats out and dump the acid in the lake. And what we've done is we've taken bets ahead of time as to how many fish we're gonna kill. <laughs> and whoever gets closest to the number of fish that float up to the surface wins the 250 bucks minus the cost of sulfuric acid. I said, it was, it's just, it's unbelievable. And of course, the blood vessels on his neck were. And I said to him, I, I said, you know, I'm not an expert in body language, but <laughs> I really did. I said, the sense I'm getting is that you think that what my friends and I are doing is. And I said, it seems to me then that you're really only a relativist in the areas of your life where it's convenient to your lifestyle. In areas you care about, you're a closet absolutist all of a sudden. And, and um, absolutism is obvious. It is obviously the case. Don't ever get in the position of having to argue for absolutes. They're self-evident. You make a person argue that there aren't absolutes. Let me give you an absolute. Torturing little babies for the fun of it is wrong. Here, let me give you another one while I'm at it. Kindness is a virtue, not a vice. Those are objectively true moral assertions and everybody knows it. And if a person can't know those fundamental, self-evident moral propositions, this is not meant to be mean-spirited. They don't need an argument, they need therapy because these are obvious truths. I'll give you another illustration of this. Again, this is not meant to be mean-spirited. It's just, it's just obvious. Uh, a friend of mine did a PhD at a major East Coast university and his professor was a, re a self-avowed relativist and a, fe and a feminist. She was invited to go to Saudi Arabia and lecture over there. She came into class uh, one day and we was pacing the floor and said, I don't know what I'm gonna do. I don't know what I'm gonna do. And it was a doctoral seminar and one of the students said, what's going on? And she said, well, I'm a relativist and I don't think anybody's got a right to tell other people what their moral views ought to be. I sure don't have a right to tell people in Saudi Arabia what their moral views ought to be, but I can't stand the way they treat women. Well, when she went over there, guess what happened? She scolded them, rightly so, for their treatment of women because she knew that when push came to shove, there were some things that are just flat wrong, just flat wrong. So postmodern relativism f suffers in these kinds of ways. Now my purpose this evening, I mean I teach a 30 week course on naturalism at the university of grad course. Two semester course on what is naturalism. This has been obviously very brief tonight. The important thing I wanna do before we now look at what's really a tension here is, is, is to summarize by saying that apologetics is important if we're gonna engage in spiritual warfare and if we're gonna be like Jesus and imitate his love for God, we need to know why we believe what we believe. Part of apologetics is understanding the three-way worldview struggle that's going on in our culture. That struggle is among uh, Christian theism, scientific naturalism that has an epistemology and an ontology, and postmodern relativism. Now, 
These other two worldviews do not agree about a lot of things, but there's one thing they have in common. And that is they both do not believe that there's any such thing as knowledge outside science. Now let me say that again. Both the postmodernist and the naturalist agree that there is no knowledge of reality outside the hard sciences. Now listen, this is what that means. What is at issue today is not simply whether or not Christianity is true. More central is whether or not Christianity can be known to be true. Is Christianity, are the creeds of the church and the central teachings of the scriptures things that can actually be known to be true? Or are they truths that you have to accept by an act of blind faith? That's what's at stake. And so the, 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 the Christian religion has always taken herself to present knowledge to people and not just truth. So this is very, very important. And I maintain that Christianity provides knowledge for people and not just truth that has to be accepted by an act of blind faith. Now, when I say Christianity provides us with knowledge, what do I mean by that? There are three kinds of knowledge. There is, and I believe Christianity provides all three of these kinds of knowledge. The first is called by philosophers, knowledge by acquaintance. Knowledge by acquaintance. Uh, you can have this kind of knowledge by just be directly being aware of something. So knowledge by acquaintance involves direct awareness of something. Uh, seeing a clock or, or seeing the yellow on this piece of paper, okay? That is knowledge by acquaintance. Hearing the sound of my voice is knowledge by acquaintance. You can have knowledge by acquaintance before you learn to think. For example, little children, before they learn to conceptualize redness, can see a red apple. They have acquaintance with it. And so knowledge by acquaintance is actually prior to thought. Indeed, frogs, uh, a frog's soul can have sensations in it, but it doesn't have thoughts. So you'd look, if you could look inside of a frog's soul, you would say, as, as God does, he can see knowledge by acquaintance with a fly, but the, thought, the frog probably doesn't have a thought, that's a fly. He probably has a sense experience of a fly and reacts instinctively to it. So knowledge by acquaintance is knowledge by direct awareness. Now you can have direct awarenesses of things outside the five senses. Like I've suggested to you, you have knowledge by acquaintance with your consciousness. You can know what's going on in your own conscious life by just being acquainted with it, by being aware of it. So instead of listening to me, you could turn inward and say, what's going on inside of me right now? And you could become aware of what's happening inside your life through knowledge by acquaintance. Christianity provides knowledge by acquaintance with God, with angels, and with demons, uh, to, 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 to mention a few. There are times when God shows up and he manifests his presence to people. I've had experiences in my life when the presence of God was so thick you could sense it. He, he was there. And you could feel and be aware of his reality. And Jesus actually said that there would be times when he would manifest his presence to people. And this happens. When God makes his presence detectable to someone, that is knowledge by acquaintance. And I'm sure that many of, if not most of you in this room, have had times in your life when you have been acquainted with the very presence of God himself. You can be aware of the demonic. There have been times when I've been in certain parts of the country and on certain regions where I can sense the presence of a demon. I was in a gymnasium of 2,500 people at mid-court waiting to hear a speaker speak and I sensed the presence of, demo, of, of demons come in the gymnasium. I looked over at the door, which was where, clear across the gymnasium, and I noted three guys come in the room, and I noted where they sat. After the talk was over with, I made a beeline for those guys, and I started a conversation with them. Found out that all three of them were in the occult and came that evening to disrupt the meeting. I could sense the presence of the demonic in those young men in that gymnasium at a distance from here to that back door further. 
So there are times when you can become aware of these beings. I be, you know what I think? I think the church has become so naturalized that a lot of times people are aware of these things, but they discount it. They just discount it. Because people, we don't want to talk about these things. Man, don't get me off on this. I could tell you story after story about this kind of thing. So Christianity provides knowledge by acquaintance with God and with the unseen world. There are times when you can be aware of the unseen world, where you can be aware of it. The second kind of knowledge is very important, and it's called propositional knowledge. Now, let me give you a simple definition of propositional knowledge, and then I'll unpack it a little bit. You guys doing okay? Okay. It's like taking a drink out of a fire hydrant, I know. But let's just, let's just keep on plowing. We've got, we've got about 10 minutes or so left, 10 or 15 minutes left. Let's just keep going. Um, knowledge, propositional knowledge is defined as follows. It is a true belief based on adequate reasons. It is a true belief based on adequate reasons. Okay? Now let's unpack that. What is truth? What is truth? Let me give you a simple definition of truth. Truth is a matching between thought and reality. Truth is a matching or a correspondence between a thought or a belief and reality. Okay? Now, could, some, could there be one object in this room and could it be red if everything else was taken out? Could redness be in this room with only one object in here? Could that happen? Yeah, if we had an apple in the room, that would work. Could you have larger than in the room with only one thing? How many things you need to have for larger than to be here? Two. Same with truth. You can't have truth unless you've got two things going. On the one hand, you have to have a thought or a belief or an assertion. And on the other hand, you have to have reality. So if I have the thought the grass is green, and if that matches reality, the thought is true. And truth is the matching relation between the two. Just like the larger than relation, stay with me, just like the larger than relation takes place between the music stand and my watch. Where's the larger, is, is, this, is this the larger than relation? No. Is this? No. It's, between, it's holding them together, the larger than relation. Truth isn't a thought, and truth isn't reality. Truth is a relation of matching between thought and reality. Okay? Let me illustrate this. Somebody says, well, that's just your definition of truth. No, it's not. It's everybody's, including yours. <laughs> And I'll illustrate it with a simple little case. I'm at the university one morning and the bookstore calls, hey, Prof Moreland, the book you ordered, Richard Swinburne's Evolution of the Soul? Yeah, it came in, you can come and pick it up. Great, thanks. And so I wonder if they're, what they're telling me is true because they've tricked me before. So I walk over to the bookstore and I trudge into the bookstore and all of a sudden, sitting there on the desk, I see Richard Swinburne's book, the evolution of the soul. You, you, you follow me. Now, what's the object of that experience? The book. You with me? But I have a second experience that's different than that one. Because I don't just see the book. I also experience the fact that my thought about the book is true. Now, what's the object of that experience? Here's what I do. Here's the book. And I say, what was my thought? Oh, yeah, that the book is in the bookstore. How do they compare with one another? They ma There's a matching thing between them. Uh, give me a word for that. Uh, truth. Truth. Okay. So I go home later and my wife says, you're angry. And I said, if you'd have seen the rain up in Vancouver, you'd be angry too. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Okay, so I, said, so I said, no, I'm not angry. Oh, yes, you are. So I've got a thought that I'm angry. And I, go in, I don't go to the bookstore this time, I introspect. Ooh. 
and I, I feel this seething anger in my stomach and chest, and I compare my thought with what's in my stomach, and you know what, I, what happens? There's that deal again, that matching thing. What was the word I used for that? Truth. Then I get my bank statement, and I realize that it doesn't match, and I realize that there's an absence of that matching deal, and I come up with a word for it. <laughs> Help. <laughs> you know, <laughs> false. False. Okay. What is truth? Truth is a relation of matching between a thought or a belief or assertion and reality. Truth is a relation of matching between a thought or a belief or an assertion on the one hand and reality. Okay. What is a belief? A belief is something you take to be true between 51 and 100% certainty. A belief is something that you take to be true somewhere between 51 and 100% certainty. Okay? If, you, if, if you're 55, 45 on something, you believe it, but pretty weakly. Now, I do believe the Kansas City Chiefs are gonna make the playoffs next year. Um, if you were to ask me how strongly I believe that, I would say extraordinarily weakly. <laughs> I'm about 52, 48 on that. I don't disbelieve it, so I'm not 60, 40 on the other side, I'm not 50, 50. I believe it, but ugh, you know, sort of in the, that area, not real strong. By the way, this is huge. Because in your Christian life, it's not true to say you either believe something or you don't. That's very unhelpful. It, it, you, it, what's actually the case is that, what, that if you believe something, you can come to believe it more strongly as time goes on. And that opens up hope that we can all work on the strength of our beliefs as we get older in the Lord and strengthen them. So suppose you believe prayer 60, works 60-40. That's something to be happy about. You're good for you. You're 60-40 that prayer works. Well, then you got to get it up to say 80-20. So keep working on it. Start studying it. Ask people if they ever seen an answer to prayer. That kind of thing. Okay. Now, now a, a true belief would be something that you take to be true that matches reality. Does that make sense to you at this point? Now, what's knowledge? What's knowledge? What's propositional knowledge? It is a true belief, it is a belief that matches reality for which you've got adequate reasons. It's a belief that matches reality for which you have adequate reasons. Okay, so we have, so illustration, we have two men. One man is a Newport, lives in, out in Newport Beach where I live, this is a make-believe story, and he's drunk 24-7. He just drinks and hangs out at the, at the public restroom at Newport Beach. And he's formed the habit that he believes everything that's written on the second stall of the men's room. His <laughs> motto is, the stall says that I believe it, that settles it. <laughs> Pretty pious, I'm telling you. So he walks in there one day and it's on the second stall. George Washington was first president of the United States. He doesn't have a clue if that's true or not. He never heard of George Washington. But he says, oh, I believe it. Well, okay, now compare him with a historian who believes George Washington was the first president of the United States, and he's got some pretty good reasons based upon 1700s documents and newspaper articles and things like that. Do you see that our two men have two things in common? First, they have the same belief, right? And their beliefs are both true. They match reality. One of them has knowledge and the other doesn't. What is it that he has that the other one doesn't have? Adequate reasons for his belief. He knows why he believes. Can you have truth without knowing why you believe? Yes. Can you have knowledge? No. Because knowing why you believe something gives you an adequate basis for why you believe it in the area of propositional knowledge, okay? Please listen. I did not define propositional knowledge as a true belief based on completely conclusive reasons. In other words, you can know something without being certain about it. You don't have to be certain to know things. There are a lot of things we know about which we would say, well, I might be mistaken, I guess, or I've got questions about it or some doubts. That doesn't mean you don't know the thing in question. 
If you know something, you have a true belief about it that's based on good, adequate reasons, not conclusive reasons. So you don't have to be completely 100% certain you're right to know something that's very important. You can know God is real and still have questions about that. That doesn't mean you don't know he's there. It just means you might not have complete 100% certainty, which is hard to find in any area. What we're after is not certainty. What we're after is confidence. We want confidence in God, not necessarily certainty, okay? So propositional knowledge is a true belief based on adequate reasons. What's the third kind of knowledge? Oh, I don't remember, I forgot. No, I was kidding. (laughs) The third kind of knowledge is know-how or skill. It's know-how or skill. It's the third kind of knowledge. And that is the ability to do something well. That is the ability to do something well. A person who can work on cars has know-how. They just know how to fix an automobile. The Bible is filled, by the way, another word for this is wisdom. And the Bible is filled with wisdom and know-how and skill. Know-how about how to pray, how to forgive, how to love, what a family is, so on and so forth. The Bible gives us wisdom and know-how. So now stay with me. I maintain against the postmodernist and the naturalist that Christianity is not just true, but it can be known. That the great creeds of the church and the central teachings of the scriptures provide knowledge. What kind of knowledge? Knowledge by acquaintance? Propositional knowledge where we can have true beliefs that are based on adequate reasons. They don't have to be completely conclusive with 100% certainty, but they're good. Good, solid, adequate reasons. And then finally, wisdom and know-how. In these three ways, Christianity provides knowledge of reality. In sum, would you join me then in a movement to spread the word about this to our own people. It is very important that we in the church recapture the K word. We need to start using the knowledge word as well as the faith word. Both are important. We can't lean too heavily on the faith word. We need both that and the knowledge word. All right, Uh, I think I'm out of gas right now, so I will quit. We'll take a 15 minute break. Uh, I think uh, someone's coming up and uh, yeah. And then we'll have a little Q&A. Thank you. Thank you.